Hi, Bob Cano, and this time on the Camp Chaos Chronicles, we're going to introduce a new but rather infrequent set of episodes called Slideshow Bob. Dang it. Now the reason that they're going to be called Slideshow Bob is because they're essentially slideshows of projects that I've done in the past that I don't have any video for, but I still think that you would find them interesting. And the first one that we're going to introduce is a project that a friend of mine, Dave Kennedy, did a few years back. Uh, it's a Factory 5 Cobra replica project that had been in an accident and uh, we renovated it. We went to the auction with the intention of buying a 458 Ferrari that had been in an accident. And there was some carbon fiber work that needed to be done. The under tray was missing, windshield was out of it. And uh, it would have been an interesting project. The price had stalled at around $60,000, so Dave figured there was a good chance that he would get it. But in retrospect, luckily, it went for about 125000 So we went over and we looked at this Cobra project. And it looked pretty, pretty simple. And here it is as it came in the door. Nice looking car. It's got nice paint. The interior was in reasonably good shape. Nice wheels and tires. Side pipes looked really, really good. Except that if you look more closely, there appears to be a little bit of a problem with that right rear wheel. And here's why. The car was involved in an accident. The driver was driving a little too hot going around a corner. And as you can see here with the side pipe, uh, he ran into either a tree or a bridge abutment or something and uh, smashed the side pipe flat, which skidded the tree or whatever it was along the side of the car. And then it just kind of dived into the left rear quarter panel and got a hold of the rear axle and bent it free from its mounts and bent the axle and the tube and we got some problems here. And it wasn't just a matter of finding a new rear axle, which we did and we overhauled that and, and replaced the, the bent one, but everything that the rear axle had been attached to was bent or torn away and there was a lot of straightening, a lot of welding, a lot of restoration that needed to be done before that was going to be made right. And the problems don't stop there. As you can see, there's a number of these tubes that have been tweaked and bent, and the fuel tank mounts have been, uh, been banged around a bit, so there's a lot of straightening that needed to be done here. But in addition to that, there was also a lot of the aluminum shut panels that were malformed from the impact um, that required a bit of straightening as well. So as you can see here, we finally got everything else sorted out. Everything straight from a variety of means and we found that not only were there a number of panels that were bent and tweaked a little bit, but also the shock went throughout the chassis and all of the aluminum rivets from the point of impact forward to right about here were popped. So we had to actually drill them all out and replace them with stainless steel. What you need to remember when you buy a car like this, which is actually a kit car, it's built by people who buy the kit and put them together in their garage, is that the standards of construction may not necessarily be up to your standard. As is the case here, we've got a builder who, in order to make room for the headers, did so with a blunt instrument of some type and the result is not particularly attractive and it was clearly visible from the uh, from the top of the vehicle when you open the hood. 
And the fact is, it doesn't take long to really do it right. Unless, of course, you got the car all together and you decide that you don't want to go to the trouble of pulling the engine, which really would have been necessary in order to make it right. But, as you can see, pretty simple process and it ends up looking like this. And it worked perfectly for the application. At this point, I got all of the interior shut panels uh, worked back into a reasonably good condition and uh, reinstalled them with the use of stainless steel rivets. And it really worked out well. Any imperfections that were left in the um, components were not real visible after the carpet was put on. And uh, I was pretty pleased with how things turned out. Now the real proof of the pudding here is when you finally get everything straightened the way you want it and you put the panels back in place, all the holes line up between the panels and the structure underneath. All you got to do is clico them in place, which are temporary rivets, and, and it, it's just a simple matter of reinstalling the rivets that you drilled out. Worked out really, really well. And while all this was going on, Tony Valelli, a.k.a. Captain Electron, was reworking the rear axle assembly out of a 5-liter Mustang that would replace the original one that had been bent up. We found a couple of new shocks from, actually, Dave's neighbor. A couple of houses down, built a Factory 5 project, and he had a couple of shocks left over. So uh, we used those and we also installed a set of new axle shafts as well as new bearings and seals and uh, also replaced everything in the, in the differential as well. At this point we could take the wheels and tires that David had bought for the car and mount them and get some idea what this thing was going to look like up on all fours. Pretty pleased with how it came out, and it was at this point that we then put it on the trailer and took it out to the upholstery shop. Not that there's a lot of upholstery to install. At this point, it was time to turn our attention toward the bodywork, and there was quite a bit of it to do. There was a lot of cracks all over the car, but the really big issue was the large amount of material that was actually missing from when the tree or whatever the object was went into the fender well and uh, tore a big hole in it. So he had to come up with some kind of a plan to duplicate material that was no longer there. It wasn't just a matter of reestablishing the curvature on the upper surfaces of the fender, but we also had to come up with a plan to reestablish the wheel well arch that was no longer there. The solution to both of those problems can be seen in this picture. And what I did first of all to reestablish the lip of the, the quarter panel, the wheel well, was to take some 3 16 steel rod and go over to the right side of the car, duplicate it by just bending it to conform to the shape of the quarter panel on that side and brought it over to this side and hot glued it in place. Had to bend it a little bit in the opposite direction to get it to conform to the existing uh, the existing lip of the wheel well on the left side, but uh, what that did is then established a uh, curve that the whatever we were going to use to fill the gap, that big hole, to actually conform to. And that was a bit more of a problem. What I did is I drew some lines vertically on the right-hand quarter panel uh, from top to bottom at two-inch intervals and then took a profiling tool, which you can see laying on the plywood platform. It's that red thing with the black stripe down the middle. It's a number of fingers that are strapped together, which you can push against any surface, and the fingers will take the shape of that surface and then what I did was at two inch intervals I took the shape and transferred it to two inch thick pink builders foam insulation and then just stacked them all together and shaped it roughly with some coarse sandpaper 
and then stuck it up on the inside of the fender well with, with hot glue. And it worked pretty well. At this point, I removed all the foam pieces from the inside of the quarter panel and took a grinder with a coarse disc on it and feathered the material back from almost nothing at the edge of the cracks or the openings and uh, took it out to uh, you know six inches or so from the crack or the opening and the reason for that is that will enable us to lay in the fiberglass and polyvinyl resin and when we're done it will be roughly level with the original surface which is still red at this point and at that point then it's just a matter of detailing to get it back to its original shape. In this picture you can see that the foam backup pieces had been reattached to the inner surface of the quarter panel and we used a mixture of five minute epoxy and a product called micro balloons for that. Epoxy by itself is kind of hard and difficult to sand but if you mix it with micro balloons which is a product made by 3M, it's microscopic glass spheres which is often added to automotive body filler uh, for the same purpose here. Uh, it, uh, it makes a product that we, you can actually glue things together, but you can very easily crack them apart, which is what we're going to need to do after we get done with the layup. You can also see that on the transition areas between the cracks and the openings, uh, we've also laid in a, um, a layer of micro balloons and polyvinyl ester resin to, uh, to also serve as a filler at that point so we can sand that back and have a nice smooth transition in between the two surfaces. We then took vinyl ester resin and fiberglass mat and laid it up on the outside of the quarter panel to the desired thickness. We've got three layers in the voids the, where the holes were and we've got two to three layers on the cracks depending on the severity of the situation. So you can see that we've generally got a pretty good shape at this point uh, being that the mat is a little more rough than glass cloth. Uh, we've got a little more sanding and shaping to do than we would with with fiberglass cloth but I feel that mat has fibers running in all directions whereas fiberglass cloth typically has that only running in two di four different directions left right and up and down and uh, I just think it makes a much better much stronger layup. Once this set up we then were able to crack the foam pieces loose from the inside um, you know, just with a hammer and chisel to begin with, take the big chunks out and then just uh, scraping it with a chisel down to the um, fiberglass layup on the outside and then take a grinder and grind it smooth and then put two more layers on the inside. And what that does is sandwiches the edge of the broken areas uh, and, the, and the voids and sandwiches them between two layers on the outside, two layers on the inside, and there's no way in the world that that's going to fail. It was easy to think at this point that the hard part had been done, but the fact is the front end of the car, when it went off the road, pushed a lot of dirt, and there was a number of cracks in the front end that made the, the front end of the car very, very flexible. And what we had to do is make sure that the front was on straight with the rest of the car. And so we took a two by four across common points the, uh, at the two side doors and put a level on it and then took a piece of plywood and screwed it to the headlight mounting, one screw on each side. And at that point, we then moved the piece of plywood up and down, which rotated the front end uh, with all the cracks and when we got the two level we then were sure that the front end of the vehicle was on straight. At that point we set about repairing all of the cracks and it actually turned out pretty straight. The problem is if you don't get that straight 
the hood and the doors just aren't going to fit right. Once we got all the front end cracks fixed, then it was time to do the final detailing of the front end and begin to put the rest of the vehicle in primer as well. At this point, we were beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel on the bodywork. And uh, I was very, very pleased at the way things turned out. Of course, when you have things in primer, you don't see exactly how things are going to look. It's only after you get the color on it that you know for sure. But, uh, but I was pretty pleased and pretty confident that this was going to be a top-notch job once we got this thing painted. Now when we had pulled the engine out, it was real obvious that there were a lot of leaks on the engine. The oil pan, the cam, or the valve covers, and, and there was just a lot of little things that I think even the rear main seal was an issue at this point. So, so David found a cheap set of gaskets that were less expensive than just buying the individual gaskets that we needed. So, heck, I got a couple of head gaskets. We might as well go ahead and put those on as well. So essentially, we took the engine down to the, to the crankshaft and did a lot of measuring and uh, the bearings were good. The crankshaft was good. I was real pleased with, with how that uh, looked and so it was time to put the engine back together. Now my thing is Jaguar V12s and it's been a long time since I worked on a V8 cast iron American engine and so it was kind of a pleasant change of pace and I was kind of uh, kind of surprised to rediscover how simple these things actually were just to basically do a disassembly and reassembly. They get more complex as you produce more and more power, of course, but, but for this application, it was a really, really easy, almost enjoyable job to do. And when it comes time to pick the paint, what are you gonna do? Early Ford Blue. Now, remember what I said earlier about the builder's standards of construction may not necessarily be up to yours, well, this is an example of one of those cases and what you can see here is the stock alternator bracket that was provided with the kit and the big hole in the outboard end is for the lower pivot. Well, the problem is that the owner is responsible to come up with some sort of an adjustment link up at the top and they provide the link but in terms of actually mounting it to the engine that's kind of up to you and this guy had basically used threaded rod and washers and nuts for spacers and the belts weren't aligned properly with the pulleys and it was uh, it was just not a really good thing so what i ended up doing is actually fabricating um, an original bracket of our own where Instead of mounting to the engine, the link actually mounted to the alternator mounting bracket, and that worked out really, really well, as can be seen in this picture. The alternator mounting position looks a little odd. It's kind of high up on the engine as compared to most applications, but the front cross member for the suspension uh, required that this be done this way. And there you go. Not too bad if I do say so myself. While all this was going on, the body was down at a little body shop in Farmington that does really good work. And the, uh, the painter was pretty impressed with what he had to work with. Cutting the edges initially, and then got busy. And eventually the thing turned out looking like this. The main color is Guardsman Blue and the white stripes are Wimbledon White. And this is a color combination that was very common on the original cars. And no one would ever be the wiser. Pretty proud of that job. And while that was happening, the interior was finished on the car. And the only thing that really needed to be done at that point is to reinstall the gauges and switches and do a bit of wiring cleanup. And at that point, David and his friend David Watson began to undertake the organizing of the wiring in the entire chassis. 
And again, this is an example of the original builder just doing what was necessary in order to get the car running. And there was a lot of wires that just didn't make a whole lot of sense. Some of them that really didn't even do anything. David ended up with a couple handfuls of, of wires once they got done sorting that out. This is a shot of what the electrical system looked like behind the dash. This work was done by Dave's friend, David Watson, and I wish I had a picture of what it looked like beforehand, but this, um, this is a job that I was really very pleased with. At this point, everything came together to the degree where we could actually put all of the components in one place at one time with the intention of actually mating them together and start making the big push to get this thing running. An indicator of how straight we had gotten the front end was after we had repaired and straightened out all of the panels that were originally in the car in the accident, we found that all of the holes lined up. It was just a simple matter of inserting the Clecos and replacing them one by one with rivets and it took just a matter of minutes. Good job. It would be easy to think at this point that we're about 95% done with a car. However, there is a saying in experimental aircraft construction circles, 90% done, 90% to go. Just about this time you think that you got it handled, there's a ton of things that need to be dealt with. For example, when the car was in this state, we decided to take it out for a little excursion on the neighborhood streets and we found out that we had first, second, and fifth gear. Third and fourth were AWOL. So we had to pull the transmission out, which all but required that the engine be removed, might as well have, um, and had it rebuilt in a couple of days and then put it back together. And that part of it worked. And then there was hanging the doors and, and getting the hood mounted properly and uh, finding a windshield, which turned out to be something of a problem. But uh, finally we got it all handled and here she is. This is a project that I was able to really enjoy. I was working with a friend of mine who was very accommodating and did what he could to rustle up parts and materials and so forth. And uh, the project itself was really, it wasn't exactly straightforward, but it was, it was really enjoyable all along the way. There was really no real black holes for time and effort in the entire thing. They had, uh, things moving along on three parallel tracks most of the time and it just really it was a it was a very good project and I was happy to be involved in it. Well there you have it the first in our series of slideshow bobs. If you like what you see and you want to see more of these like us, subscribe to us, follow us on social media and we're going to see you the next time on the Camp Chaos Chronicles.